This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Dollar revenues in 
to um, stable funding of, of the programs. And then thirdly, and here's your Dutch disease point, you need to pool any savings you do decide to make in such a way that you're protecting your economy against Dutch disease, um, first and foremost, um, to stop depreciation of the, the uh, currency, which is going to undermine alternatives to mine deep in the long run, and make imports very cheap, and then thereby undermine again. So crucially important to exchange rate. But also ravers, you've got to hold the fund in a way that stops particular um, maverick actors, maybe even presidents, getting hold of the money and doing all kinds of illicit things. I'll come to an example of that in a minute. And then, and this bottom and the fourth one is the most um, difficult and interesting, I think. You also need to be turning those savings that you're making gradually and prudently in a safe way into domestic investment in order to create those long-run alternatives to mine. Um, okay, so. Um, fashionable response at the macro level, let's say the macro level, this macro level first, um, are what they call sovereign wealth funds and stabilization funds. Um, and sovereign wealth funds are popping up all over the place at the head. Um, and for the top, the, the largest 50 in existence today, over half of them have been created since the year 2000. And it's very much the, um, the, the, the mode at the moment. Um, and I think you know, the concept is very simple. You, um, you, you, you agree to put money at a, a, um, an agreed rate, you put on consensus, into a fund um, which you may well hold in, uh, abroad outside the country or in the country, but hold it in a way that is very secure with a good diversified portfolio and with very strong rules about how you can, uh, who can spend it and how. Um, but also probably you, there may well be a stabilization fund, which may be separate from the sovereign wealth fund, and that will be money held precisely for the specific function of allowing ministerial budgets to be stable over time. Okay. Um, now, um, of, um, what does it mean to say? These funds are extremely fashionable today, but they are simply no magic bullet, and they're only as good as the institutions and the politics behind the fund. Um, and you know, I've got a book here full of, full of horror stories of what actually happens in real life with some of these funds. Um, one or two good stories, but quite often they're not very good. Um, the horror story that I just mentioned to you would be the, the Cameroon, where the fund was set up in the 70s by the president, um, saving up oil revenues. Um, he set it up under presidential control, under his own control. He set it up overseas. And it was a crime even to ask how much money was in it and how it was being used. It was all, it was all secrecy. Um, and the IMF and World Bank, who later repented of this terribly at the time, they liked the fact that it was held abroad and in complete secrecy because they felt it was the only way to protect it from a lot of raiders within the Cameroon society and the economy. Um, but um, when um, politics went extremely badly wrong, and basically that president resigned but then regretted resigning and tried to come back with a coup from outside the country, um, it was tremendous political trouble. Um, the president just raided the fund ruthlessly for spending inside the country for um, years beyond the point of ration rationality and, and reason. And there were endless stories of awful corruption and uh, misspending and um, phantom projects and all the rest of it. It's a good read here. Okay, so my point is huge institutional needs to control, to monitor, to see that it's used widely. Um, the example that's always quoted as the good boy, um, you get, you've seen the answer there, but you would have known it before I put it up, because it's Chile. Um, Chile has done um, well um, with a stabilization, it has two funds, a stabilization fund and a sovereign wealth fund. Um, and um, please, though, will you please remember the exceptionality of Chile. Chile, for very deep historical reasons, has unusually strong institutions, particularly in the fiscal field. So its ability to set up and manage this kind of fund is very atypical um, of Latin America. And that's a crucial point. Um, the, um, the very good looking minister of finance, ex-minister of finance, Andres Velasco, is now busy exporting the Chilean model all over the place um, in, in Africa, and I don't know where else teaching, teaching everybody how to do it. And I hope he understands fully how exceptional his own country is. I suspect he does, and I'm not sure he does about it. Um, okay, 
But the fourth need, the fourth need, the turning of savings into domestic investment, is um, where we should spend a bit of time. This is so difficult. This brings us to the micro side of development. Tony, I have not removed the word development from that slide. I wrote down an alternative definition. It cost me um, eight words, so I wasn't going to modify my, my part went for that. But it's incredibly difficult to do this kind of thing in a con and this spreading of money from a bonanza resource um, at the local level when institutions are weak and difficult to do it at any level through your, your economy and society. Um, and of course, um, economies that have been based for a long time on a very buoyant, on this kind of natural resource motor of extractives tend to have a legacy of weak institutions, weak and or perverse institutions. And that's simply not a matter of chance. The incentives have been all wrong for many years to set up the complicated institutions you need to diversify the economy, to allow for other activities to survive than the bonanza um, um, activity. Um, so, oh, too fast for me. Um, right, so, um, right. Um, what, what are we trying, what are we talking about? What is it that we need to do? What we need to be doing, and um, it's come out indirectly in lots of aspects this morning in the Caroline. What we have to do somehow is diversify. And this is a matter of diversifying sectorally, other sectors than mining, and regionally, locally, within the region, all right? Why? Well, I think the answer is clear. Um, Mining, on the whole, does not employ very many people. It doesn't give very many economic opportunities. People, um, in the long run, obviously, mining's not going to be there, but even in the short term, the medium term, mining is not going to provide um, economic opportunities to very many people. So other activities need to flourish. They need to flourish in terms of justice, clearly. They need to flourish in terms of managing tensions. Um, extractives, um, it's very obvious as you look around the world that conflict and extractives go together. And that's really, new, again, not a chance, because extractives, <coughs> again, by definition, um, mining is going to be a point source. It happens at a particular place of place. Um, and that generates tension, generates tension with local communities, generates tensions with um, the municipality, with the regional government, with the national government, tensions <coughs> throughout the whole story. Um, okay. So, um, and behind this challenge of diversifying other sectors and within the region, there is a huge institutional need. Um, and as I say, we simply haven't got this, and that's because the incentives have been wrong for a very long time. I want to give you an example. The example is um, Tintaya, which has been mentioned this morning as a less happy story um, than the Quilliavetical story that, um, that he was talking about. Um, yes, Tintaya. Um, my photographs are going to work, but they're not colourless, Caroline. <laughs> so, um, here, here's, um, you can see the mine on, on the on picture here, and then here again in the background of the mine. Um, I think, um, I'm not very satisfied with the photos, but I think in a way they do sum up the institutional challenge of creating alternatives to, to mining um, in this area. I mean, just, uh, I do think the, the entire story, which one or two of you here have heard me talk about before in the, the, the PSG, because I find it incredibly illuminating. It really illuminates this point about institutions too. Okay, what happened with, um, with Tintaya, which is up in Espinar in the highlands of, of Cusco, um, is that this very big copper mine, um, copper and gold mine, um, was incredibly badly managed over but um, yeah, I'm going to have to hurry with some time. Um, over very many years, both in the hands of a large multinational and later in state ownership, both in the state as well. Um, at the time we come into the story, in the early 2000s, it is owned by BHP Billiton. Okay? And BHP Billiton was not getting on at all well in an effort at dialogue. It just wasn't prospering. People were extremely bitter and resentful. It wasn't working. Um, BHP, um, be billet and then agreed to be part of an Oxfam Australia scheme which took managing directors of companies like this off to 
um, places like India for an educational three weeks. They lived for three weeks with the mining families and get to see the whole story from the other side. The managing director of the Peru operations of Tintaya went to India for three weeks. He came back converted like St. Paul on the road to Damascus. It was extraordinary the change in this man. He came back and said, we cannot go on as we have been before. He said, we can start. And um, they really had to turn around and really work on the process of dialogue. And they entered it you know, with all the goodwill that you had from, from you this morning in a very, very convinced way. And amazing results. The company agreed to be um, to two very generous settlements, one to the local communities through a fund and the other to the local municipality. Uh, wonderful. It was acclaimed as an amazing success. Something like two years later, everything had collapsed. There were riots all over the place, tremendous frustration, the mayor taken hostage in the mine. I don't know what terrible things happened. The reason, I think, is very, very clear. <coughs> the story is very different from um, two story in the morning. Um, um, the, the problem was, there was the lump of money in the fund with conditions to access it. The communities and the municipalities simply did not have the skills, the capabilities, even perhaps in some ways the confidence to know how to get at and make use of that money. There simply wasn't the supporting infrastructure from the central government or the regional government. There wasn't the, 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 the microfinance. There wasn't the um, contacts to market. There wasn't the information. None of that was there. But the result that simply providing the money, which is what the, the route the company had chosen, was worse than useless because it just awakened expectations and created enormous frustration and eventually riots. I mean, of course, BHP Bulletin gave up the whole project, um, um, not for that reason, but perhaps in part for that reason. Um, it's now an extra um, owned company and the situation is very bad, extremely bad, very, very tense at the minute as we talk actually. Um, it's very bad. So let me sum up, I mean, there's a variety of needs I'm identifying. And I'm insisting that there are needs for now because of the need for diversification. There are the needs for long run, the long run to build an alternative to mining. And my point is that unless you build them, start building now, which is what really resonates with Caroline's presentation, unless you start building these institutions now for post mining, there'll be nothing when you get to post mining. So in that sense, those two need to really come together. Support the small businesses, support agriculture, which at the minute is really dying under um, uh, well, you've heard amazing stories there this morning from, from Carlos about um, the mayor who employs everybody in the area because he doesn't have else to spend his money and um, the farmers apply to him for their, for their labour. Extraordinary um, waste of um, distortion of the culture. Infrastructure needed for information flows, for access, education and health, for capabilities and, and motivation, and channels between the different levels. It, to me, this is so important. Um, channels so that people at the local level can really knock on the door of the regional government and make their, their case. Um, the regional government can really knock on the door of the national government. We saw that working out for Latin America in a rather curious way. I'm not sure how repeatable it would ever be anywhere else, an interesting way. Um, normally it simply doesn't work, those contacts don't get made. And then my final point, consensus on what revenue should go to each level. And this is also this is also an institutional point and an incredibly important point for building the long run and for building alternatives to mine, both in the short, medium, and long run. And I think who um, honestly has got it badly wrong. It's putting a lot of money into the canon, which, which Carlos was talking about this morning, and it's putting through the canon in a very unequal, distorting, challenging kind of way that is creating enormous tension and inequality and ineffective spending as far as we can see. The cars is right we really actually don't know the answer. So just not good at that. Okay, thank you.